only 20% of Americans except the 66 books that are bound together in what we refer to as the Bible are actually the words of God. There it is. Just 20% affirmed actual word of God to be taken literally. Not sure that I would have phrased the questions that way, but I know you and I would probably both say, well, you take it literally where it's literal and you take it. Yeah, it that's a good distinction. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by literally? Exactly. 49% didn't like the lack of nuance in the question, so they answered inspired by God. In total, 69% of Americans <laughs> think the Bible is a God book leaving just 29% affirming that the Bible is merely a book written by men. It's not as dire for Christians as first reported. We need to discuss this issue. Do we really have the Word of God? Yep. Let's discuss and see if we can grow that recorded by man category. Welcome to Apologia, we're a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today, we're going back to our roots and looking at Eric Hoven's Creation Today Show. Welcome to the Creation Today Show, where we bring together interviews with experts. Hey, wait. Is that me in the intro? Where it says, interviews with experts? This is very confusing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Greg Kokel. Greg, welcome to the Creation Today oh, Show, sir. Eric, it is so sweet to be back with you again. Let me add two qualifiers here, Eric, to start out. Okay. This may sound, might sound uh, surprising uh, to some people. This issue that we're discussing now, I actually do not discuss with non-Christians. And the reason oh. is, is because when you look in the New Testament, you don't have anybody arguing for the authority of the New Testament writings or the Gospels or, uh, or the Old Testament writings before they make their case for Christ, okay? So if we want to know detail about God, as followers of Christ, we need to do that. Authoritative detail, we need God to tell us. But that isn't what people need to know in order to become Christians. I want people to, to take the Bible as a historic, especially the New Testament. At this point, making the case for Christ, it's on Jesus, right? That means the Gospels principally. That Jesus, that the Gospels are historically reliable and not necessarily inspired by God. And the reason, one reason is the minute I bring up the inspired by God appeal, well, then I have to make the case that the Bible is inerrant, because if God can't err, then his word can't err. And then that invites a, just an avalanche of suggested contradictions that you got to deal with, and that's overwhelming. So I just sidestep the whole thing. Well, the Bible's not the word of God. It's full of contradictions. That's not the case I'm making. Here's what I'm making, is that the Gospels are reliable about Jesus, and that's who we're talking about. So these are just qualifiers to lower the bar a little bit, so other people's expectations are inappropriately high when we make the case for the authority of Scripture. Yes, how convenient that the all-powerful, all-knowing God needs us to not have high expectations when it comes to his existence or authority, and quite an admission up front by Greg that he cannot clear a high evidential bar. Far from raising the bar or the epistemic standard that Christianity must meet to be believed, I... I lower it. As a man who's built his ministry on the infallibility of the Bible to the extent where he believes it on the age of the earth, biological diversity, and geological reality in the face of overwhelming contrary scientific discovery, Eric Hovind isn't going to like this minimal facts approach. This is outside his comfort zone. But what you just said, there was also, for some of us, that's hard because, I mean, I was brought up, <clears throat> I believe the Bible, I believe we can back up the claims, I believe it's all there, and so we want to go into all these things when the reality is Christianity, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, is based on the truth that Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried, and rose again. The third right. according to the scriptures. Yeah. Simplify things. Don't make it harder for yourself. Don't throw a bunch of things out there. Don't try to talk about the second coming. Don't don't talk about the beginning of the Bible. Hitting Eric hard. Well, don't talk about the end of the Bible. That's all complication that can come in later. Talk about the middle, Jesus, because that's the issue. Don't add more complication. Now, all right, so here's here's the real important question, I think. The question is, what kind of book is the Bible? And there's only two options. It's either a book by God in some sense. In other words, he's the main author, or it's a book by men about God. It's either a, a product of, of a human ingenuity or insight, or the source principally is God. Not a perfect dichotomy, logical negation, but I'll allow it. Now, if the source principally is human, it's going to bear all the liabilities of all human documents, partially true, partially false, etc., etc. However, if the source is divine, we ought, to, we ought to see elements in the book that are characteristic of something supernatural, all right? 
It, in other words, it can't be explained other than by a supernatural. Perfect. That's what we're looking for. Let's go. Let me take off the six reasons and give a little substance to them, okay? The first one, and I, I use my hand as a, as a way of remembering things. So the first one, pinky, prophecy. Pinky, prophecy. Remember, we made a comment about that earlier. If there's fulfilled prophecy that's bona fide, that's reasonable to believe, was written before the time the prophecy was fulfilled and could not have been engineered in its fulfillment, then it's reasonable to believe that there's a supernatural element going on. I'm glad to see Greg affirming number one and number six of my personal criteria for establishing a supernatural prophecy. Number one, made clearly and demonstrably prior to the events predicted. Number two, intended to be a prediction. Number three, a non-mundane claim. Number four, answerable only by a single, clear, verifiable occurrence. Number five, not open to interpretation. And number six, not something people are actively attempting to fulfill. Now, what was the earlier comment he referenced? Well, I did, I did say kind of in when I was promoting this show, I, in order for it to be the word of God, for it to have an extraordinary claim, it would have to be backed by extraordinary evidence. That's a claim we hear all the time. That's right. Well, the phrase has great rhetorical value and it makes perfect sense to a skeptic. It is somehow massively misunderstood or misrepresented by our theist friends. And so my friends, as clever as Sagan was in his words, it appears that poetry must give way to pragmatism in order that theists can understand our meaning. So, here is our new slogan. Claims of things that I do not perceive as usual require evidence that has sufficient claim-affirming properties to overcome my pre-evidential assessment in order for me to personally become convinced of said claim. Should we put that on a t-shirt? I did, in fact end up putting that on a shirt. Yeah, I have a concern about that. And the problem is, and this is strategic, if you get in a conversation with somebody's pushing back and they offer that qualification, the problem with that qualification is, and I've encountered this many times, that when you start giving evidence that you think is adequate, that you think is extraordinary evidence for the extraordinary claim, um, it's very easy for them to say at the end of the day, well, that's not extraordinary enough evidence to support the claim. That's just it, isn't it, Greg? you're giving evidence you think is adequate. But since no one can choose what convinces them, it might be entirely inadequate for others. This is no one's fault. There's no universal standard of convincing because we're all starting out with a different set of initial assumptions. That said, for any true proposition, it is hypothetically possible to provide sufficient evidence for even the most ardent, staunch disbeliever. I have much more to say, but perhaps you can go visit my Extraordinary Claims video for that. So I reject the claim entirely. I, I reject the qualification. You don't need extraordinary evidence to support extraordinary claims. You need adequate evidence. That's all you need. That's right. Sufficient evidence to overcome doubts and objections, which vary from person to person. You need preponderance of evidence, you know, over 51% to be rational in believing. Okay. Let's remember here that Greg's standard for believing a claim is 51%. You don't need to make a hundred prophecies. If you have just one that seems irrefutable, then you have very good evidence to believe that there is something supernatural going on there. 51% confidence is not at all the same as seemingly irrefutable. 51% is highly refutable. That's a bait and switch here by Greg. I've yet to see a single so-called biblical prophecy that passes my basic criteria. What do you have, Greg? Now, I know that there's a number like 350 prophecies of the life of Christ fulfilled in the Bible. During Jesus' lifetime, he fulfilled more than 300 prophecies. List, please. I've actually seen lists like this one. The method of counting seems somewhat arbitrary. For example, four of the matches are descended from David, and six of the matches are from Zechariah 9.9, where we must assess nuances between visiting Jerusalem and arriving at Jerusalem, or between being just and humble. We'll talk a bit more about how mundane some of these are but another good chunk are about theological ideas we can't test, or future events like restoring God's kingdom on earth. It, that's probably true, but a lot of them are kind of a reach for non-Christian readers, okay? A virgin shall give birth. That's a complicated passage, all right? That's an understatement. Complicated enough that I've got a few videos on the topic where I brought in scholars in the field. Now listen, I know that people will argue about whether or not the original language supports the idea of a virgin, or if it's just a young girl. The Hebrew word Alma generally means young woman or girl, while the word Bethulah generally means virgin. 
But it can mean virgin in the sense that many young women are virgin. <laughs> but the word doesn't mean virgin. It doesn't mean a woman who's never had sex. In any event, there's a lot of them that aren't, though. You read Psalm 22, and this is taken as a messianic passage before, um, long before the time of Jesus, okay? And that reads like a, um, like a description of a crucifixion from the perspective of the person being crucified. This is the one that starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All right? We all know that because those are the words of Jesus on the cross. And then you have this description. And this comes, what, 750 years before crucifixion was used as a form of capital punishment. And by the way, the Jews never used it. Eric put up this graphic with Psalm 22, 14 to 15. If this poetic language is interpreted as symptoms, perhaps dehydration, joint dislocation, heart failure, starvation, and xerostomia, that's hardly unique to crucifixion. It's consistent with almost any sort of torture or prolonged suffering. Certainly not anywhere close to the realm of irrefutable that Greg wants to offer. They were stone they were stoning. The Romans used it. And then Eric puts up verses seventeen and eighteen. Again, this doesn't point to general crucifixion. The gospel writer records a divide garments detail to the story, but given that the gospel author directly connects it to Psalm twenty two, and the uncorroborated clothing detail can't be confirmed to have happened, it seems likely to be a literary element rather than fulfilled prophecy. Definitely not irrefutably supernaturally so. Bewilderingly, Eric doesn't put up Psalm 22, 16, which is the verse that most directly prophesies crucifixion. I won't go into the details here, but depending on a single downward stroke of a pen in competing manuscripts, the Christian translation, they have pierced, is rendered as like a lion in Jewish tradition. So again, this is highly refuted. Not close to approaching Greg's promise of irrefutable. Okay, so there's there you got that. In Daniel nine, you have amazing prophecy of uh, of of the coming of of the Messiah, and uh, I don't have time to go into all the math right now. But when you work out the math of it, it gives you numbers of days that look like from the time of the start during Daniel's uh, right after Daniel's life to the ending of it. I covered the scholarly debate about Daniel prophecy math in a recent video responding to Dr. Michael Brown. So see that for more. Probably the biggest problem that the missionaries face with this passage, you can imagine this is a serious problem, is that the calculations don't add up. Probably most people that would present this are not capable of doing the math themselves. Or in order to present this properly, the average listener would go into a coma listening to uh, you know, sort of a, a detailed analysis of how all these weeks work out and the calculation. It's not an easy to present kind of passage. But once again, Jewish scholars point out many flaws in the post hoc rationalization and numerical manipulation of the scriptural appropriation Christian community. As a non believer, I have no horse in this race. But you can't expect me to look at this chart and be blown away that it is irrefutable prophecy. I'm just simply saying. If we have bona fide examples taken by a reasonable person. Reasonable person? Are you saying that these centuries of people who have dedicated their lives to the study of these things and who disagree with your particular interpretations are automatically unreasonable? Apparently, Greg can define himself into correctness. Given the history that follows to be fulfillments later on, then we have a supernatural element here. I don't know how people can deny that. We must deny it, because neither you nor your community has put up even a single example that passes my minimal, reasonable, very basic criteria. Not one. I don't know how people can be impressed by any of this. We have so much of the Old Testament that was clearly written down before the life of Jesus. We have copies of the Old Testament that, that were written before Jesus was born, and especially the famous scroll of Isaiah. And that shows that the Isaiah, like Isaiah 53, there's another one, um, that, that this was written before its fulfillment in Christ. Yes, Isaiah 53 manages to pass the first of my criteria, but none of the rest. The gospel writers, and probably the oral tradition community before them, were scouring the scriptures, looking for anything they could to connect the Old Testament to Jesus' life. These passages were not intended to be prophetic, have verified fulfillment, are highly interpretive, and the reporters were clearly 
actively intending for these fulfillments to come to pass. So that's the first one, prophecy. Okay, I'm zipping through this quickly. I'm not. I'll have to get more succinct as we go. Here's the ring finger, right? That reminds me of the unity of Scripture. The unity of Scripture. Now, most people don't appreciate this particular point because they're not familiar with the, the corpus of Scripture. So your point about the reliability of the Scripture can't be appreciated by anyone who isn't already intimately familiar with all 66 books of your Scripture? I've read the entire Bible multiple times and committed a lot of it to memory back in the day. I'm about as familiar as a layperson can reasonably be with the corpus of Scripture, and I can tell you that I definitely do not appreciate this incredibly subjective, squishy, nebulous point. You mentioned 66 books, right? From Genesis to Revelation, there's a coherent story that runs from the beginning to the end. As just mentioned, the New Testament authors are entirely forthcoming in their desire to connect their stories, imagery, and theology to the Old Testament. It is no more surprising that the New Testament parallels the old than it is the newer Star Wars films seem to connect with older Star Wars films. Anakin, you know, kind of duplicating the Luke Skywalker role, but you see the echo of where it all is going to go. And instead of destroying the Death Star, he destroys the ship that controls the robots. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. An argument is made by some that everything the Gospels record about Jesus can be traced back to Old Testament inspirations. Jesus' birth and flight to Egypt echo Moses, for example, and Christianity flagrantly retcons portions of the Old Testament to remake it to fit better. His name is Brett Con. He has the power to make things always have been other things. I think that's called retconning. You always were able to be killed with coffee. <laughs> New plan, run. Jesus was always there when God created the universe. The serpent in Eden was always Satan. Non-messianic passages were always intended to be messianic. And so on, and so on. And don't get me started on the Old Covenant versus New Covenant theology. Or books like Ruth or Song of Psalms that are wildly out of place. We also know that the New Testament documents were specifically accepted or rejected into canon based on how coherent they were with the fluid notion of orthodoxy. Anything outside that narrative was just rejected. So this coherence was, in part, manufactured. How am I doing on keeping things succinct? Not good? No. So you see, and these were authors of pieces that didn't have connection with each other, that didn't know what their stuff meant. They didn't know how it all fit together. That is demonstrably false. Many times in the Gospel of Matthew, the author points out that some event was intended as a fulfillment of Scripture. This guy knew exactly how it was to fit together. But when Jesus comes, you can see all of this coming together in a very profound way. So now there's a unity of the Scripture, second finger, that defies common Oh, I should say not common sense, but defies naturalistic explanation and is another mark of the supernatural. I just gave so many naturalistic explanations off the top of my head. I see nothing at all here that requires even a hint of a supernatural intervention to explain. Basic sloppy continuity is remarkably easy to achieve, particularly with centuries of post hoc rationalization and harmonization at your disposal. Uh, the middle finger is the big finger, and that reminds me that, that the Bible answers the big questions. Most people have a very different reaction to the middle finger. My daughter, when she was about eight years old, she asked me, why, why, why do we believe God is true, is the way she put it. I said, the reason that we believe God is true is that he's the best explanation for the way things are. The prize of best explanation isn't automatically handed to the idea with the broadest explanatory scope. Sure. Every question can be answered with, God did it. But every question can equally be answered with, universe creating pixies did it. No. The criteria for evaluating the best explanation includes coherence, internal consistency, parsimony, Occam's razor, the fewest assumptions, consilience, compatibility with other established explanations, fertility, the ability to make new predictions, and testability, having falsification criteria. The general notion of God is unfalsifiable, doesn't make novel predictions about future data, and certainly adds assumptions. I'll leave it to you as to whether the notion of God is internally consistent or compatible with other knowledge. In any case, 
God is not clearly the best explanation for anything. Okay, this is the explanatory power of the Christian worldview. Explanatory scope, not explanatory power. Unless Greg is going to put forth some novel predictions of future data. But simply put, when you read through the scripture, you see these characterizations of reality there, and they resonate with our deepest intuitions about the nature of the world. Resonating with our deepest intuitions about the nature of the world is not a reason why something is true. Human intuitions can be very wrong. We think objects are solid. We observe the earth is flat. There's chaos theory, relativity of time, quantum mechanics, biological evolution, and the uncertainty principle. I'm harsher than most, but I straight up reject intuition as a way of knowing. We know we're fallen. Everybody knows something's wrong with the world. Doesn't matter where you lived or when you lived, you know something's wrong. And that something's wrong with the world is something that's wrong with us. No, what everyone can identify is that there are aspects of the world that could be better. Identifying opportunity for improvement doesn't make something wrong with the world in a sense that it was once better than it is, or that there's some grand design that the world is no longer following. The idea that something is wrong with us is particularly strong because we have a frequency bias of being forced to observe every single one of our personal failures after setting our own arbitrary standard of what failure even means. And so we all know we're broken and we feel bad about it. We feel guilty. Because I see them all I know more of my own flaws than I do of anyone else's flaws. So it's easy to convince me that I'm flawed. Why do we feel guilty? Hey, maybe because we are guilty. Guilt is a trait that would be selected for in social species because motivation for compliance is a survival advantage for the group. But who are we guilty for before? Well, you know, you see, and you can go step by step through these things. And again, I'm really, I'm tightening up here for time's sake. Good reminder. I'll try to. So we have big questions that are answered that resonate with us deeply in our spirit. It's true because it feels true. That's faulty logic. Okay. Then we have an, this, the index finger, and I think of this as the index to history. The scripture, when it touches on historical elements, and that's a massive part of scripture, um, can be verified at many points that the history is accurate. Usually what is meant by this is that the names of locations and occasionally names of people can sometimes be verified through archaeological finds. Of course, on most biblical claims, archaeology is unsurprisingly silent. Where details do align, they're about as historically conclusive about the events of the Bible as evidence for New York is for proving the events of Spider-Man. Okay, now this is important in Christianity and in Judaism because both of these faiths depend on God intervening in history. Judaism at the Exodus. Relatively few historians would affirm that the Exodus as described in the Bible was an actual event that happened, and the subset who do cling to it are radically divided about the details and how archaeological facts can be reconciled to it. See my recent videos on the topic with Dr. Joshua Bowen or Dr. Bart Ehrman. This was a very bad example by Greg. Christianity, the person of Christ and the resurrection, the big events there. Okay, that's probably a worse example. I have quite an extensive playlist detailing so many problems establishing the historicity of the resurrection. Even Christian scholars affirm that history can't establish this event. Dale was bringing up, as an historian, I can't say whether Jesus rose from the dead. Why would Ehrman and, and Dale say mm. that historians can't? Right. And I'd say because historians acting as historians don't have the tools to prove that God raised Jesus. We got uh, prophecy, we have unity of scripture, we have answering the big questions, we have index to history, we have thumbs up, okay? You see gladiator, thumbs up, it means life, right? That means that the scripture changes lives. There are lots of books that change lives. Now there are lots of books that change lives, okay? Lots of ideas that change life, for good or for ill, whatever. But you know that the scripture has a track record over thousands of years of radically transforming people's lives in a way that let's face it, defies naturalistic explanation. Oh, I'm facing it. I'm looking it square in the face. Please tell me what the tangible difference is between regular books changing lives via natural means and a special book changing lives in a way that defies naturalistic explanation. What are the criteria? What are the markers? Please describe the gap between the most life-changing non-God-written book and a God-written book. How can an outsider like me tell the difference? What am I looking for? People's lives are completely turned around. Look at the uh, the Apostle 
Saul, I mean, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, for example. Well, that's not a great example, is it? Paul's life wasn't changed by the Bible. None of the New Testament was written at the time he converted. Lots of people's lives have been influenced like that for Christ. And lots of people have been influenced by lots of things, often with radical effect. So you have a supernatural ability to transform lives. Okay, you make a fist out of the whole thing, and you have a survivor. You have the Bible has survived through persecution and criticism and all attempts to eradicate it. Okay, but literally every book that still exists has survived all attempts to eradicate it. And boy, there have been a lot of attempts to eradicate it. Possibly. A lot is a subjective descriptor. What level of document survival surpasses the natural human inclination to preserve important things and up into a realm of supernatural survival? Again, what's the gap? And how can an outsider like me identify it? In 1973, I went behind the Iron Curtain working in the Soviet Union with persecuted Christians. We got stopped on the border. I was in five communist countries, but they took our Bibles away, all of our Bibles. And they said they were scared of the Bible. Okay, but could the Soviet Union have done anything to eliminate the Bible from the world outside their borders? No, and at no point was the USSR, nor was any authoritarian nation in the past 1600 years, in a position to eradicate the Bible from the earth. Should I be surprised that people have failed to do a thing that was outside of their ability to do? Why was God needed to accomplish this non-supernatural, non-feat? What makes this explainable only by divine intervention? So so these are six things here that, that to me are all tags of the supernatural. To me? Five of these things are entirely mundane observations. Okay, so this is a book from God to man. Prophecy, pinky finger, ring finger, unity, big finger, uh, the big questions, index finger, it's the index of history, thumbs up, it's changed lives, fist, it has survived. The book has had a positive influence on some people. Copies of the book exist, affirm some intuitions about how the world works. Some names in the book can be verified as having existed. The chapters the editors collected together have a vague, common theme. This describes countless books. Prophecy was Greg's only unique chance here, and yet to date, no single prophecy has been put forth by Christians that meet this basic, bare-bones criteria. And maybe one or two you might find changing lives or historically sound, whatever, might be found in other works. When you add all of this up together, it makes, I think, a powerful argument that this book is not simply a book by men about God, but it's a, it's a book, as it claims to be, from God to human beings, through human beings, but authored by God. Adding up a bunch of nothing doesn't magically make something. Well, that's incredible. I, I, I love the six things I wrote them down. I hope you guys are taking notes because seriously, these are things that you can share with other people. That's the whole reason we're doing this. If you're out there and you are a skeptic, I'm just telling you, you ought to look into these. I have. And here we are. Do you think the word supernatural claims, and it does make supernatural claims, do you think that's why some people or skeptics will claim, well, if it, for it to make a supernatural claim, it has to have extraordinary evidence? Do you think that's it? Or is it like, it's not an extraordinary claim. It's the word of God. That's, that's, it's, it's, an, it's a normal claim. If God exists and he gave revelation to mankind through his word, it's not an extraordinary claim at all. It's, it's, you're throwing extraordinary in there when it's not extraordinary. It's, well, it just dep it depends on your worldview, Eric. But if you're an atheist and you're a materialist, in other words, the only thing that exists are, you know, matter in motion, you know, just meet all the way down, so to speak. Well, then it is extraordinary to claim there's something outside that world. It's extraordinary to them. Good for Greg for at least partially understanding. The problem here is, given that this is an extraordinary claim in light of their worldview, it doesn't require what they're going to call extraordinary evidence. It only requires adequate evidence. But if you want to convince that person, the evidence will need to be adequate to overcome their worldview, not merely adequate enough for an already believer to accept. If all you care about is preaching to the choir, sure, set your evidential bar on the floor. If there is just one chance in a million that this is true, it's worth believing. And if I can give even some, if I can give you evidence for the existence of the soul, for example, that is really compelling. Well, that is evidence against the materialistic worldview. Sure, I'd love to see the evidence for the existence of the soul that is really compelling to someone with a materialistic worldview. If that's the prerequisite, maybe you should have done your show on that. If you're really a hardcore materialist, 
you know, then it's hard for, you know, maybe they're not going to be convinced with anything, but it doesn't mean that the evidence we give is not adequate. It means that your evidence is inadequate to convince a materialist. In principle, even a hardcore materialist will change their mind. I was a hardcore Christian for most of my life. And then evidence changed my mind. Oh, wait, Eric doesn't like that. You know that I, you know, we've had this conversation, I disagree every time I hear you say on your channel, a former Christian examining the claims of Christians. Sure. And that's my first, every time you say that, I'm like, oh, I just, I, I cringe. Do you think that Romans 1 is actually referring to that? Because, I mean, how many times have we poured the evidence on somebody and they still sit back and go, yeah, I'm still not going to believe it. I'm still not convinced. I mean, how much evidence does it take? And that shows sometimes it's an intellectual issue. It's kind of a hard issue. They don't, they don't want to believe. That generalization is ridiculous on its face. Myself and so many others were desperate to keep our faith, hold on to our faith. I had no plans to leave. I was setting out to prove Christianity correct. My heart broke when I couldn't believe anymore. I wanted to believe. Eric is just wrong about this. I think you're right. And so is Greg, I guess. Okay, what do we do? We got guys, I, I have a, a friend on here who's an atheist. His name is Paul Inns. Hey, that's me. And he says, number one, never use Romans uh, 120 with a non-believer, though. Um, although I think Paul and I have had that conversation. Exactly. Go watch my never use Romans 120 with a non-believer video for all the reasons why. Yikes. I'm assigning you with a lot of homework. Sorry about that. I'll put the whole syllabus in the description. So when it comes down to the question, do we really have the word of God? I think of both sides. I think of the Bart Ehrman side or my, my friend Paul who would say, I don't think it accurately reflects what really happened. Um, so I think, okay, how do you deal with the hoops? Because in, 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 my, in my studies, what I found is, boy, you're really having to manipulate and really having to do a lot in order to go, that doesn't reflect reality. It's a whole lot easier to believe it's reality than it is to believe it's not reality. Reality isn't determined by what's easier or harder to believe. He's right. Deferring to God did it is not intellectually taxing. Where staring down harsh, counterintuitive notions demands effort and fortitude, Greg is advocating lazy thinking as a virtue. And then we got the other side of people going, well, I just believe it by faith, and, and they don't even really believe it for good reasons. So mm -hmm. that's an excellent admission. There are Christians and non-Christians alike who arrive at conclusions without warrant or even considered thought. That's what my channel would love to correct. Whenever you have critics to any issue, uh, what it comes down to is the reasons and the rationale regarding the objections. And 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 that's really critical. Now, it, it sometimes the reasons and rationale are driven by a commitment to a foreign worldview. Now, I, 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 that doesn't bother me. I understand how that works. And so we have kind of a kind of a, a, a bias towards our own view kind of thing. And so uh, there can't be supernatural events in the Bible because that must be a mistake. Why? Because super event, supernatural events don't happen. It's not that I hold that supernatural events can't happen. It's that I have no reason to think that they do until I've been shown otherwise. Look, if somebody says, I can't trust the Bible, well, it depends what they mean by that. Is the authoritative word of God, that's one standard. The other one, as reasonably historically accurate regarding the details of the life of Christ, Christ that's another standard. I want to argue or debate or discuss the second standard with a non-Christian, uh, because the first question brings up, the first standard brings up all kinds of other issues that then need to be answered. Like, what about this? What about that? What about the other thing? And maybe that's the reason that Peter Enns, and uh, I think it was the same Peter Enns I have in mind. I have one of his books here in my book yep. in bookcase here. I think it's a different, this is Paul Enns. Oh, Paul Enns. But... Okay. Okay, maybe they're related. I don't know. It's but... possible, even probable, that we're related via a common ends ancestor. I'd love to play the Mennonite game with Peter sometime and find out how closely related we are. But I digress. We just have to look at the reasons and the rationale and see if they're compelling. You've got to take it on an individual basis. What are the reasons? And a lot of what I've seen about the reasons from from people turn out to be straw man. In other words, it's a mischaracterization of what the Bible has to say or their misunderstandings. Well... If any Christians can let me know if I'm misunderstanding or mischaracterizing in anything I said in this video, please let me know in the comments. I mean it. It turns out that even though these are good reasons to take the Bible as the Word of God, as a supernatural book, not simply a natural book, um, this isn't the real reason that I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And the host of listeners that you have already believe the Bible is the Word of God, and they don't believe it for the six reasons I just gave, because this is new to them. How do they believe it? Okay. It's the same way people came to be, believe Jesus in the beginning. They encountered Christ. Okay. You pick up the book, you read it, 
you engage it with an open heart. We're engaging the scripture. And so many of your listeners can know, gee, when I started reading scripture, it just came alive to me. There's a self-attesting element that the Holy Spirit is involved with, giving us conviction that this is the word of God. And this is why I don't have a problem with a person in one sense saying, well, I, I just believe it's the word of God. I don't have all these other reasons. I just believe it is. Well, they probably believe it is for a good reason they haven't thought about. And that is the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in their heart. And I have invited the Holy Spirit to give me this same assurance, but nothing. If the Bible can appear to be the word of God only by means of God telling me so, then me and the fate of my soul are simply out of luck. The ball is in God's court. So uh, we can give um, first uh, third person public reasons. In other words, reasons that are accessible to anyone for the authority of the Bible and that it's God's word. But when it when push comes to shove, it, it's really something more personal. So you're admitting that those publicly accessible reasons aren't sufficient reasons the way you were pretending they were at the start of all this. The fist doesn't come into play at all, except of some kind of post-belief comfort food. First, first person private. It's not just first person private. We have these other reasons to help protect us from having just our subject, subjective experience being the guide here. But it is a subjective. It is the Holy Spirit touching our heart and convincing us of the truth of the Bible. The Holy Spirit touching your heart? is literally a subjective experience being your guide. What we don't want to do is we don't want to raise the, uh, accept, accept the limitations that raise the bar so high that we can't get over it and let the, the, the opposition, so to speak, the objector set that standard. No, we're going to set the standard. Which means you don't have a goal of convincing non-believers. Fine. We're just going to give adequate. We're going to try to give adequate um, evidence for our claim that the Bible is the word of God. And, and if you're, you know, if they, they can take it or leave it. If that's all you got, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it. The one who convinces people that the scripture is the word of God is the Holy Spirit himself through these means. But he's the real source of them. Something you could have said earlier to save us some time. Ah, oh, well, I hope you lift up your hand and remember a pinky ring, uh, the big finger, the middle finger, the big finger, the big point, index of scripture, thumbs up, uh, change lives, and then uh, how it has survived. What a great, easy way. To, I, I, that, I remembered it. That's pretty good for you. Okay? <laughs> good for you. Good for you, Eric. And if you'd like to see this former Christian taking a look at the claims of Eric Hovind's creation today, tap on the thumbnail on the screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.